Uh, so thank you so much, everyone, for taking the time to be here today and to listen to me. Um, uh, I just want to start with a bit of a disclaimer. Um, I, uh, for confidentiality reasons, I'm not uh, representing Wattpad today. And uh, the exam I'll go through a lot of the deliverables with examples and working docs of what I've worked on, but they are not the exact representation of the work I've done. So the problem or the exact numbers or the experimentation details will uh, are different, and and that's also done for privacy and confidentiality reasons. Um, all right, so uh, I'd love to walk uh, this group through uh, deliverables that uh, usually produce when working on AI products. Um, I, I hope that the goal that we can achieve today is kind of understand what is the ideal set of deliver deliverables when we work on AI products, when they are needed, why they're needed, and why they're critical for a successful project delivery. Um, and so hoping to go through the agenda of like the need and scope of deliverables. And while there are many, this list is not exhaustive. Uh, I've highlighted like a couple of like key deliverables that I think are really have been really useful for me while working with my team and stakeholders um, and, and just a couple of final takeaways. So hopefully all of this information should be useful. Um, yeah, so let's uh, start with like why there is need for deliverables and why we are here today to talk about deliverables specifically around AI products. And I think like, the key reason being that there are unique challenges when you're building AI uh, solutions. Um, one of the big ones is really knowing whether this is the right problem to solve and if it's the right problem to solve with AI. Um, building resilient real world models. So there's a ton of like uh, robustness that's required when you when you launch and productionize uh, large scale models. Um, and building a POC is far different from building reliable like uh, models that follow regulatory compliance. Um, and then thirdly, there's um, a huge levels of technical understanding that needs to go into it when uh, when a PM is working deeply with data science and machine learning teams. Um, finally, there are data privacy and security uh, concerns, uh, ethical considerations, uh, as we are all well aware of. And lastly, there's rapid advancement uh, and like evolution in the space right now today. And so considering all of that, uh, it's really uh, clear that you, there are specific and unique challenges that AI products have. And one way to mitigate like or make this, these challenges, uh, like mitigate the risk of these challenges is through thorough documentation. And so um, when you think about like why you need a specific deliverable, they address a lot of different concerns. Um, they help with providing alignment, collaboration, and clarity for the teams and the groups that you're working with. Um, they definitely help with providing a lot of transparency, which is highly uh, important when it comes to building algorithms that are not black box. Um, they serve as a great communication tool, which is again, really important in building trust with different teams and stakeholders. Uh, they help with like decision tracking and efficiency tracking. Um, they also help with iterative learning. So if when you're tracking the different versions, the various decisions that you're making on the fly, um, you really will know like what are the small parameters that you need to continue iterating on. Um, and finally, yes, uh, the risk management and ethical oversight, I've mentioned this before, and I cannot stress how important this is in terms of a deliverable or documentation when, when you're building out um, AI products. Uh, they also help with accountability. Um, and finally, like if depending on the way that your product team is situated, it will help understand and make decisions around scalability and reusability of certain models for different applications. Uh, yeah, and that brings me into uh, the next section that I just kind of want to give a high level overview around is like, usually what are the scope of deliverables and how does the scope of your deliverables, uh, how are they affected and what are the factors that affect them? Um, so at a high level, like uh, I think the role of an AI product manager sits um, in, in between or kind of in the mix of these two uh, core domains, I would say. So one is like you are an AI PM who is... Uh, mainly working on a lot of core skills, you're still flexing all of those muscles. So you might be someone who is working and owning a part of a problem that has an AI component in it. So you might be working on like um, the homepage of uh, some app and there's a chatbot uh, element associated with it, or there is a you know recommendations engine associated with that homepage and you do own the end-to-end -end experience of that. Or you could be in a more domain specific um, kind of AI PM role. And like the way I'm thinking about this is like you, your company, or like the team that you're in, the, your primary output is the model. Um, so I would think like, you know, Cohere AI PMs or Open AI PMs, their primary product is the model itself and may, may not necessarily be an, an experience that has uh, the output of the model integrated in it. 
and depending on where you are in which uh, where you're situated in the teams the scope of your deliverable will change so you might be more heavily leaning in the core side um, where in that case uh, in addition to all of the things that you do already produce as uh, an ai as a pm uh, you would also have to add some sort of like an AI lens to it. What I mean by this is when, uh, for example, like the business goal alignment and product strategy. So when you are proposing um, a problem to solve or a solution, um, you usually would highlight like how that solution addresses or aligns with the high level company strategy, the high level product strategy. In addition to that, now you need to add the AI lens of like how using AI to solve that particular problem will help uh, help the company in like the long term uh, and how does it support the company long-term uh, strategy so and similarly when you do market or competitor research you're not just doing for example if you're a competitor of netflix you're not just looking at the entertainment industry but you're also just looking at like recommendations and search engine and all of the uh, other companies that have really good ones and this could range from e-commerce e to healthcare and you're really com competing at a technological level so these are the kind of ai lens that you would apply to the role that you're already doing and that's how the scope of your deliverable when it associated with the core skills might change as opposed to domain skills where you might be working on um, building the model itself or assessing whether you want to make build versus buy decisions. And so the type and scope of your deliverable will change depending on like where you're situated in and what kind of team. Um, the other thing that impacts the scope of deliverables is also the type of uh, model uh, that your company follows in terms of team teams. Um, so we are all familiar with like the squad model, I'd assume, and then there is also a really famous platform model. And I am sure there are different types of team uh, models around this, but I, I'm just focusing on these two because these are the ones that I've primarily kind of uh, come across when it comes to AI products. So you can either be in a squad model where you're an AI PM integrated within a squad and the squad has like the end-to-end -end, like designer, researcher, ML engineers, data scientists, everyone, and you're delivering that product together. Or you might be in a team where you are um, a platform team, where the entire AI team is a platform team. You have a, a AI product manager, you have data scientists, machine learning engineers, and you support various uh, you support many of the use cases in the organization. So there might be a trust and safety team that you have to support or an ads team that you have to support. Uh, so you're really the in-house talent in terms of like supporting various uh, data science use cases. Um, and again, depending on where you're situated, your scope of the deliverable might change. For example, if you're in this sort of a setup, uh, your priority will be to look at like how much reusability or scalability of models uh, and how do you document that and keep version, um, keep keep track of the versioning. Uh, and you might have to think about like the end-to-end -end experience in terms of the model performance, but not so much if you are in the squad model. I mean, it, you, it's still best practice to do that, um, but it's not necessarily something that you do on a daily basis. Yeah, and the, the next piece that I'll quickly touch upon is uh, depending again on how you're situated in the team, uh, what type of model that you, uh, what type of team model that you're in, um, the different aspects of uh, like how how deeply you'll be invested in the various stages of the model building lifecycle um, will impact your scope of deliverables. So I uh, the one that I'm going to show you all is inspired by that crisp DM model, um, and it's the I, so you start with ideation and discovery. So if you're more on the core skill side, um, the kind of like uh, documentation and deliverables associated and the depth that you'll have to go into in this area will be really high. Um, and, and next stage was like the data collection and preparation, um, the model development, um, model deployment, and finally, like the monitoring and iteration once it's launched. Uh, and I went through this part a bit quickly because I want to talk about each uh, area. And it depends, again, one uh, like how deeply you're involved in each of these sections, and that impacts your scope. So, for example, if you are making build versus buy decisions and you're in a core domain area, um, you might not necessarily have to um, like dive really deep into the data collection and preparation side of things, or even the model development side of things, but you might be more concerned with deployment and iteration. Whereas if you're building something in from scratch in-house, then all you'll be really deeply involved in all of these areas. Or if you're using an off-the-shelf model that needs a bit of fine-tuning, so you'd be involved in all the areas, but not in as much depth. So really the scope of your deliverables is impacted by the life cycle and how deeply involved you're in in each stage of the life. Life cycle. Now, having said um, 
all of that, I will move on to the key deliverables that I want to focus on uh, today. Uh, and again, like I said, it's not an exhaustive list, but it is the one that I do. I am only focusing on ones that I think are really critical or the ones that I have come across uh, quite often in, in my experience. Um, some of these I'll dive into really deeply. Some of them I will highlight. I like, I provide high level overviews and highlights, um, but it's really like drawing from my own experience. Um, so let's start off with the first one, which is a product requirements document. And I think like the place that this is mostly uh, important and is used is when in the ideation and discovery phase. Um, so the purpose of the document is very similar to any traditional product rule and why we would need um, kind of like a product uh, requirements doc there. It's really to drive uh, the problem area and to drive clarity around the problem area, hone in on the jobs to be done for the user and also bring alignment across different uh, stakeholders in the company. Uh, some of the key things to highlight when you're building out a product requirements document, as you already might know, is the problem statement, but from a lens of also like how, why why should we be using AI to solve this problem? Um, and what is the market and competitor landscape? And once again, like uh, the lens that you would add here would be, why would you, uh, why would using AI to solve the problem give us either a leg up against our competitors or how are our competitors currently solving this problem and do they use AI or not? So these are like some of the lenses that you would use um, and you would add to your already existing uh, product requirements document. And there are other important factors to add at this stage, which really concerns with data. So how are you going to use data for to build out whatever your solution might be? Do we actually have that kind of data in-house? Um, so really like assessing that will be part of the requirements document to be able to kind of understand whether it's feasible for us to um, move forward in this path or does it require more investments in this area? And then uh, definitely some ethical considerations in terms of like what are some uh, the risks that you foresee and how might we think about like mitigating that. So I think it's really a snapshot at this stage of why we think what is the key problem to solve, why we think AI uh, should be used to solve that problem. Uh, do we have the budget capability data and what is the investment really that's needed to solve this problem? And I think the other like the risk management aspect also needs to be highlighted here to an extent because you might be doing all of these things, but you still might not come out with a successful model and that's just the nature of building um uh, like AI models and and I think like communicating that at this stage to stakeholders and um the company uh, like uh, would be really critical um, so I'll give an example. And once again, I just want to iterate that this is not the actual problem that was solved. And there's like some similarities, but I've changed some of the details. But um, like for a, for a platform like uh, Wattpad or Good Novel or any, any platform really that has multiple categories, um, this is really UGC. So even YouTube is a great example. Um, the problem that we were trying to kind of address here is like, how do we understand the, which story belongs in which genre? And uh, genres are really broad. And how do we make sure that like there are subgenres, themes, tropes, all of this is considered when a story is published or when some kind of content is published on the platform? And how how uh, should this rank in certain pages and how should it be shown to our users? And um, there's one aspect is like when people are uploading their content, they tag it in certain ways, but that's not nearly as specific as like what, uh, as specific or broad as like the exact categories that exist on the platforms. Um, so how, what, what do we do uh, to help content that has a lot of like details, sub, -th sub genres, themes and tropes, how do we help it be discoverable uh, in like the browse experience or in category experiences um, better. That's really like kind of like one of the big problems that many content platforms have. And um, one way that uh, we were thinking about potentially addressing this problem is by using a multi-class classification model. Um, and some of the things, I won't dive into the details of like why this model, why not key clustering. So we considered a couple of different models, but what I will like dive into is like, how did we make the case uh, to, to build something like this? And so really diving into the user problems and the jobs to be done for the user was key. Um, many users when looking for content are looking for really specific and relevant content and not considering the depth of the um, like 
you know information in a content to be able to surface it for users is a problem in when it comes to discovering content that users like um so really highlighting that was critical looking at how other competitors and like i said in this case not just looking at what wattpad or um patron um or um, good novel do but also looking at like uh, netflix and spotify and how how like big content companies like youtube and how do they tackle this problem um so it's really industry agnostic in in a sense when you're looking at like the competitors um and then just really thinking about like why should we be using ai to solve this problem why is there another way to do this is there a feature that we can build uh maybe to get the person uploading the content to give all of the details that they might need to um so that we don't actually do something like this in the back end was another like key thing that was considered and like weighed as an option against uh against the like a like against a model in house um and like really thinking about like how much uh, scalability would that require and and all of that was considered as part of the prd and then um also in terms of applications is if we build something like this in house can it be only used for this particular like browsing or categorization uh, work or should it can we also use it in our recommendation systems or search in the future so there's like other like in applications and reusability that was considered uh, and like finally what is the level of investment needed in house if we are going to build this do we have the capability in terms of like data scientists uh, time and do we have the budget and what is the timeline that we are looking at um and finally i think and one of the more important ones that i would highlight is uh when using should we be using ai to solve this problem and that really goes down to like is this our core competency and what i mean by this is like this is where you kind of make a decision of like whether you should build this in house or whether you should build it with a vendor uh, and what i mean by core competency is co core competency is that is this where is this the market that your company is playing in um so if you are looking well, for example what part it's a entertain it's part of the entertainment industry and our content and our data is really proprietary and building models in house when it comes to uh recommending content is our core competency as opposed to um maybe building models in house for example for a ads use case or a trust and safety use case because that's not uh like kind of the a market that we are in and there are players in that market or experts in that market from who we can buy um or we can make build versus buy decisions with them in terms of like using proprietary models for trust and safety for example so so really kind of like knowing what is your company's short term and long term strategy in terms of like the market that they want to play in and whether that's the core competency is also something critical in helping you decide whether you should invest in building certain models in house or not yeah um all right and that that kind of uh, concludes like the high level information and like key pointers to highlight in uh, the prd documents and move on to the next one which is the data documentation and uh, this is in the second kind of stage in the life cycle um when it comes to around data collection and preparation to build certain models and uh, again like the purpose of this document is really so that we capture and we know the details of all the data sets that we have um and what is the quality of the data do we what is the level of investment that's needed to bring it to a certain quality if we don't have the data should we buy the data like really there's a lot of like considerations that need to happen in this stage and we need to document that so that we're able to make uh, decisions around it um and while like this is not something that primarily the uh, the product manager owns it's a product manager produces it's something that collaboratively with the team uh, led by the uh, tech leads uh, we are producing this together uh, and some of the key things to note here is like we need to be able to identify where our data sources are coming from um so how are we like uh, do we have uh, how are we collecting the data are we going to use some third party data um if we don't have the data should we build a feature to first collect the data and then start uh, Uh, building the model so there's like all of those considerations that we need to highlight here secondly the quality of the data so um how much work would be needed for us to clean and pre process that data uh, privacy considerations how are we collecting the data do users know that we're collecting that data uh, or do we have consent and are we following regulatory guidelines uh, related to this um and that kind of goes into like some of the bias and fairness concerns as well um and i'll dive into like this uh, continuing on the example of like the multi class classification model uh, so like some of the things that we considered was like do we actually have the data on like the genres the subgenres the themes the tropes the things that we needed um if that data did exist in the content itself 
do we have the, is that the right data that we need for this uh, is it good enough data like do we have enough uh, quantity in terms of that uh, and is it good quality data so is it labeled is it not labeled and in our case it wasn't so we had to go through a huge labeling exercise as well um if not uh, if we don't have the right data then do we have enough budget to buy data that's similar to this um should we be building features that we can use to collect this data um and what is our plan in terms of labeling the data of the label if the data is not labeled and how much data do we need in terms of training validation and testing the model and so these were all some of the considerations that were made um and i'll move on to the next one which is the a model documentation itself. So um, this comes at the next stage. So once you have your data, you've collected it, you have clean data, you, you have labeled data, good quality data, you can now dive into this uh, stage, which is to build and actually train your AI model. And uh, once again, the purpose of this is really so that uh, you can have a lot of transparency and you, a lot of decision making in terms of like what kind of models model is the best that we need to select right now for the use case that we do have. And I do think that this is the stage where PMs and um, the, the tech teams have to work really closely with each other because uh, you have the perspective of what the long term vision is for, let's say, a particular problem space. And you know what is the level of investment that you might want to make. So uh, you all also know what areas are more risky in terms of like uh, producing something in front of a user. So how transparent and how explainable that model needs to be is a key question. And how well it solves the problem for users is another consideration. So um, uh, there's a lot of information here, but I want to kind of move to one uh, to this first because I'll go through each of that because the model development process in itself is broken into like multiple like stages and each stage requires some sort of like working doc or deliverable so that we're actually tracking this in a lot of detail. I would say this is probably the most important piece where the AIPM and the team have to collaborate. So the first part of the model development um, process would be selecting the features of feature engineering, right? So this is the process of like identifying what are the relevant features that you need to be considering from the raw data so that can, that can be used by your machine learning algorithms um, to solve a particular problem or a use case. Um, so in, like, for example, like, um, let's say we were building a personalized, personalization ranker for a recommendation engine, right? So if you want to build something that personalizes things for users, what are some of the uh, features that would be critical for us to extract from the data? It might like, basically the question here, what we're doing in feature engineering is what is personalization for the user? What factors impact personalization? So I've, I've created like a, a list over here just to, as a demonstration to show like what would be the things that I would consider if I would be building a ranker model like this that has to personalize. So maybe the age of the user is something that's important. Maybe we consider their search history, their location, and all of these things could be um, uh, factors and features that impact uh, whether or not a user finds some content personalized. Um, and there's the, once we have a set of these features, then the like data science team, they do a bit of correlation analysis to see if these features are strongly correlated to user conversion or user, like, uh, user engagement and things like that. So whatever is your objective. And once you have that kind of correlation analysis done, you can finalize your set of features and use that uh, to uh, optimize or build your model. So this is just a high level example on how, what kind of feature, what a feature engineering exercise could look like. Um, and go, building off of that example, like this is again, like a demonstration that I've put together in terms of what was the old ranker and what were some of the features that were used there. And uh, after doing this sort of feature engineering exercise and understanding what is the objective that we were optimizing for changes the features that you would like think about. So if you're optimizing for engagement, you would have a set of features that would be important, important to convert the user into an engaged user using a personalization model. But let's say you were optimizing for diversity, then the set of features that you would consider to make the recommendation diverse would be different. So the objective is really important here. And you can see that like this is a representation of old and new like ranker features. Um, 
The second part is like, once you have your features engineered, the second part I would say would be the selection of the algorithm. And all of this has to be kind of recorded in your model document. And the key parts of selecting the right algorithm, I would say is um, the interpretability of the algorithm or the model, the computational efficiency, as well as its performance. So you're kind of balancing these three things uh, to decide what is the right model to use for the particular use case that you do have. So if you have a very simple use case of, let's say, Actually, I do have an example, so I'll move there, yeah. So if you have a use case, let's say something like, I want to improve the relevance of search results on a particular page. Um, you have to really think about what is the right model to use. So let's say you're considering between the, a personalized ranker model that uses a simple XG boost versus a cross encoder model that actually has semantic matching and a high level of relevancy um, in terms of like vector search. Um, the the first thing I, like you would have to consider is like what is the use case that you're solving for are you doing something in terms of like a navigational query or a highly exploratory query um so if you're doing something more exploratory and you want to drive results you might go with something that's more complex like a cross encoder model because it does do semantic matching but if you're doing something navigational in terms of helping users uh pull up like one document or one product, then you may not necessarily go with something that uh, complex. So th it's a balance. I've grossly simplified this example though. So bear that in mind. The other things outside of the use case that you would consider is like which one has more computational costs and which one doesn't. So cross encoder models require GPUs and there's uh, some cost associated with it. They're not as interpretable as uh, like XGBoost or uh, you know random forest tree models. Uh, so these are some of the like trade-offs that you would make and you would highlight like what is the model that you selected and why. Uh, and again, this is part of the deliverable that you will be producing. Um, the third part that I won't go into too much detail, uh, but I've highlighted a few things here is uh, how are you training the model and how are you validating it? This part of the document primarily I rely on my data science partners to produce, but it's highly important that the team does do that because it helps with explainability, interpretability, it helps with version tracking, and it really gives um, like... Uh, uh, it distributes knowledge across like different team members and you re you de-risk that single point of failure when you record all of these details. And finally, uh, I'll move on to the last part of like the model development process, which is the model performance report. Um, as the name suggests, this is like uh, once you have selected the right features, once you've uh, kind of selected the right model, the architecture, once you've trained your model, how are you evaluating the performance of the model and what were the results of that offline evaluation? So here, what I'm talking about is just the model performance and not necessarily like you've deployed it or run an experiment around it. So what is the ongoing performance of that offline evaluation? Uh, and really the, the key stakeholders here would be like, product managers, even the business stakeholders, data scientists, because you're, continue, you're you're going to make that decision at this point of what is good enough. Is the, is the performance good enough? So at this stage, you're kind of really weighing against like how much time you've already spent uh, building the model, whether you hit that yield point of diminishing returns, um, what is good enough really for you to move forward and make a decision of whether you need to uh, deploy this model or not. Um, so for that, you'll evaluate the performance. And as we know, like the actual value and predicted value of like models, whatever the error is, that's what we're talking here in terms of the error margin. Um, so the first thing would be like identifying what is your offline success metric. Um, are you optimizing for precision, recall, F-score, MRR? There are so many. So again, this really depends on your use case. Um, for something like recommendations, you would usually, uh, again, it depends on what you're recommending. But an F-score, if it's if both, uh, you know, if it's a highly important thing that you cannot afford to lose um, any sort of engagement on, uh, then recall would be something you'd optimize for if it's something that you want to drive a bit more conversion on precision might be something you would optimize for so like identifying what that use case is and working with your team to uh, like figure out what you're optimizing for is critical and then the next thing like i mentioned is like what is a good enough uh like percentage for precision recall or whatever it is that you're optimizing for is this an improvement that you're making for an existing model or is it a baseline for the very first time because then the uh the threshold of what you think is good enough will be very different um balancing yield point and diminishing returns like how much time should you continue 
to spend improving it uh, if you're not getting as much returns or as much improvement uh, increments in kind of the percentage uh, changes. So these are some of the things and it really helps you assess the strengths and weaknesses of your model. And uh, if you don't really hit the performance that you want, it does not necessarily mean that you won't deploy the model, right? So I think like there are risk mitigation strategies that you need to think of like once that's done. So I, these are like kind of like some of the decisions that you would make in this stage. And so it's, I cannot, emphasize how critical it is to uh, record all of these decisions and and like the, the reasoning behind why. Um, so for example, like again, um, if you have a personalized uh, ranker model that you're building, um, and I, I've just made up like some of the um, numbers that uh, like were similar to what we observed is um, our old model was performing at 40% accuracy and 45% precision. We selected these two as a success metrics to track. We didn't use recall. Um, and we updated some of the pipelines and we made a couple of changes and we saw that the model performance improved quite a bit from that. At this stage, we had to make a call. Do we want to uh, make this change and continue and keep this or do we want to invest in building a new model? What would the amount of effort be to build the new model? And do we think it might be worth it? And uh, so what we did at that time was we de deployed the the updated version of the old model. And then we deprioritized building a new model immediately, but we took our time and we built it when we had the capacity and we had, uh, we, when we when this became a priority for us again, and we came back to build the new model and you can see some of the performance uh, results of that. So it, just because like, you know, this model is performing at 55, it doesn't mean you don't deploy it and you invest in building that new model. You kind of have to figure out what works for your roadmap best. Yeah, and finally, I uh, will talk about the, so now I think like the, the next part of the deck that I'll be talking about is not related to the life cycle, but it's because uh, the life cycle after model uh, development moves into deployment and iteration. So I'm, I'm not really touching upon that area right now, but I do want to move into some other deliverables that I think are really critical. So the experimentation log is one that is uh, super critical when it comes to um, when delivering AI products. Primarily because once you've done building the model, uh, you have to prove that it works well for the objective that you are working towards. So if you're working on, let's say, increasing engagement or building recommendation models that drive conversion, um, then how? what are the success metrics that you're looking at? And how do you uh, measure whether the model is improving that final objective that you do have? Uh, so these are some of the things that you would track in the experimentation log. Again, this is something that is uh, done in quite a lot of detail because there are multiple decisions that need to be made here. So the first thing would be like, what are we testing and what is the primary objective of what, what is the metric that we are trying to move? Uh, all of this needs to be or, like aligned with your product uh, requirements document with the company strategy, the product strategy, et cetera. And then really diving into the details of the experiment itself. So um, why are we running the experiment? What is the sample size? What is the minimal detectable effect that you're looking at? What is the population that you want to be testing with? What kind of sampling method are you going to be using Using. Um, and this, there are so many different like methods that you can choose from. What makes sense for the objective that you're working on? What is the statistical significance? All of this needs to be recorded in your experimentation log. Um, and then finally, what are the results that you observed? Uh, and making those decisions again, whether this result is good enough for us to move forward with uh, deployment or not. Um, so there's this document is like critical to make like these decisions of finally making changes to the user experience. Um, so let's say like you have a role like on Netflix um, so based on your watch history or based on your reading history. So this is a recommendation role that's supposed to be personalized. So a quick snapshot of what your uh, experimentation document could look like is, is this, where you highlight the experiment name, you clarify the user problem, you clearly state your hypothesis. Um, a good hypothesis will be clear. It will have some sort of measurable like impact. Um, you clearly state your assumptions. Um, you highlight the success metrics. So this is different from the offline metrics that you're evaluating. This is the user experience metric. So how, how what is the click-through rate of the recommendations or what is the completion rate of users who started watching a movie? How many of them added a movie to their watch list? Things like that. Um, what is the launch criteria? So what needs to happen in the experiment for you to make the decision to move forward with that experience or with move forward to production? Um, and like other like um, logistical details in terms of like, when are you planning to launch it? Who is the audience that you're targeting? How is the audience going to be bucketed or how do they qualify into the experiment? 
um, I have some more. So again, like the minimum detectable effect, like I mentioned. So what is the minimum amount of change that you want to be able to detect in the experiment? So this will help you understand what should be the audience size that uh, will have to be in the variant. Uh, what is the traffic and how are you allocating the traffic? And again, what type of experiment is it? Is it ABC? Is it a multi-arm bandit? Um, and what is your primary um, experiment success metric? So there's, this is quite a bit of detail that I usually provide stakeholders because it's really uh, important for everybody to be on the same page in terms of what we're testing and when we will call the experiment a success. Um, and this is like just a representation of what, you know, once we have the results, what kind of document we produce to showcase that results back to uh, stakeholders and, and the teams. All right. Um, so I'll take another pivot now at this point, uh, because once again, I'm just going through some of the key highlights of deliverable. So it's not necessarily connected in terms of like a project lifecycle. But I mentioned earlier in terms of like the issues of working with like AI models, like it's not always perfect. And there is going to be like models are not going to be perfect no matter what, right? Like there's going to be like uh, some error margin. And um, I, I like I mentioned this before that just because there is an error margin or there is the model is not performing at w w a level that you think it is it does not mean that we don't deploy it it just means that you have to highlight the risk and understand if the risk is something that is okay to take and what are some of the risk mitigation strategies that we need to employ um depending on that error um so yeah always have an error recovery strategy because uh, if the model doesn't perform at its uh, 100%, which it won't, uh, there will always be a possibility of some sort of negative impact to your users. So your risk mitigation strategy will be key in terms of like helping your users not um, feel the impact of negative impact of those models. So there are a couple of like ways that you can manage this risk. So uh, transparency uh, is one uh, sort of like technique, explainability of models uh, so that users know and can know how to influence the model is uh, important. I think we all know, uh, we all understand and users are really tech savvy. Uh, we say things like we are training our algorithm on Instagram. So things like that. So users do understand uh, and we need to be able to explain it and give them a bit of control over that. So user feedback is another key risk mitigation strategy. Um, the design and support, using the design in a way that it supports uh, our users. And I'll go through a couple of examples is another important technique. And lastly, uh, thinking outside of the product experience itself, giving users an offering outside of the product experience, such as a discount or making up for their negative experience is another way to manage the risk. But all of this obviously depends on your use case. There will be some use cases if you're building like a medicine, uh, like a disease detecting algorithm, then it, these are not the kind of, like, your error margins will be really low and you have to make really difficult decisions. So uh, like, all of this is with uh, that perspective that your use case is something that is okay to take on some of this risk. So one example really um, at Wattpad, what we had done was uh, the like uh, we have a personalized recommendation model that recommends stories based on what your previously read story is. Um, so again, we might not always get the stories in the recommendations, right? Uh, so the negative impact here to the user might be that they don't, they feel like recommendations are not relevant to them because there's only backend changes. They don't understand why they're seeing certain stories. Um, so one way to mitigate this risk was through design explain, explainability. So having really clear row titles so that users know why they're seeing a particular uh, recommendation is critical. Um, and this is different from, let's say, a Pinterest experience because on Pinterest you have the infinite vertical scroll and you don't necessarily you're not necessarily told why you're seeing every single like kind of pin um, but again this depends on your users and your use case and and what what is the specific problem that they are facing and uh, another couple of like uh, interesting examples in the industry in terms of like risk mitigation with design has been um, for example, Netflix, they have this very, really clear feedback loop uh, where you can say you like this, you don't like this, you love this. And I think like all of this feeds back into the algorithm and they then give you a better match. And you also see sometimes that this is a 90% match to what you like and things like that. So there's a lot of explainability that uh, goes into uh, Netflix's uh, user experience. And there's also a lot of like user feedback and feeling of control that the user has in terms of like driving um, their experience. 
um teams had an interesting one where uh, they had a noise suppression model and uh, in, in order to mitigate the like the failures of the noise suppression model they paired that with live transcripts um so that even if you if it doesn't work always you still have the transcripts to kind of support the experience of being on the call uh uber has a really clear search pricing communication uh, so really double down on that transparency as a mitigation strategy so that users know why the prices are high at certain periods of time and then google photos also has uh, uh, like um, the ability to edit and rename you know whatever labels or folders that you have um, in case the auto labeling models fail and there have been instances where this has not uh, played out really well for them in in really bad ways so i think like making sure that the user has control over some of these experiences is also really critical um yeah and i'll move on like to the uh, last like second last part of like another uh, critical ai deliverable which is uh, communication plans uh, and i think this is kind of plays into a bit of the risk mitigation but also into user experience and providing explainability and transparency to users and it starts internally if your team if your stakeholders and if the leadership does not understand what model you're using how it works how it how it can be influenced and how it's driving uh, results in the product it's going to be really difficult tomorrow if that model fails or it becomes stale or if users have any problems with it for us to be able to defend it or kind of like explain why it's happening and make changes to it so really starting internally with a with a with a detailed communication plan will really help in setting them up or like setting your communications and support teams up to communicate with users and to take feedback from everyone um so uh, an example that i'd like to provide is the uh, like a, a role that we developed on whatpad called top 10 uh, it's very similar to like netflix's like top 10 tv shows or movies and in terms of internal communication plans this was one of the uh, critical uh, roles because it was a, it, it's a, if you go to the website you'll see it's on the top of home right now so it drives a lot of engagement has a lot of eyeballs on it uh, and so a couple of things that i had done here was like really communicate clearly why we're building a role like this what is the problem that we're trying to solve what are the role objectives so that every person all stake critical stakeholders know what this is uh, addressing um providing them detailed information from the feature engineering step as to what are the features that we are using to drive some a recommendation role like this um you would think it's like popularity it could also be trend so like how often do we refresh the role how do uh, stories in the role change how can users influence change so what are the features that go into the model development that uh, that can be communicated to our users in a way that they know how this role works clear explanation again on what algorithm was selected and why we selected that uh and then additional information and this is something that i always do and i would really highly recommend it is the you go through you don't just build like one model one time and you know it's done your kind even within that model development process you know where the team is continuously iterating and sometimes on the outside like Uh, especially like different stakeholder groups are not necessarily aware of how much work goes into it and i think there's a bit of like empathy building exercise that uh, needs to happen over here so i always showcase like how many iterations have happened how many different models were built in that process sometimes it's over 30 um and it really depends on how important that use cases and like just like the timeline and the effort that the data scientists have uh, undergone and like what user problem they are trying to solve this really helps build empathy and like kind of break narratives that might be uh, um going around the company in terms of like oh the algorithm is broken or it's not working so we are all on the same page as to like what is the work that's going into it and why it's not perfect uh and finally also always share like if there are dashboards or pocs that the team does showcasing the results and showcasing how you made the decision to move to production again is critical so all of this uh is already generated as you go through each of those deliverables that we went through up till this point we already have generated all of this information so just making sure that that is communicated in a very clear way to internal stakeholders especially non technical stakeholders is very important um and by doing this and equipping them it's really easy for them to create communication plans that help our users because at the end of the day you're building something so that users are able to use it and engage with it and be sticky on the product um and so like 
but this is another example where equipping them with all of this information enabled that team to kind of create an FAQ. And if you like really review the FAQ in a lot of detail, it drives into information on like how the algorithm weights uh, the rank and how we're providing, um, you know, fairness and uh, the ability for everyone to rank in like top 10 as long as it meets certain criteria. So there's a lot of that information that's directly given to our users. And then there are other ways that you can communicate this information with your users, such as like newsletters, feature tools, notifications, uh, in-app explanations through explainable design strategies uh, like we went before, we went through before. And then also you can have like uh, blog posts that the company releases. Um, all right, last but not the least, uh, I would love to like take a bit of time to just go through um, the ethics and um, like how can you make sure that you're building fair um, and responsible AI products. Um, there are two kind of documents over here that I will highlight. One will be an ethics and risk document, and then there's also a regulatory and compliance document. Um, and while there are many different ways to kind of do this, one that I have used is uh, something like this. It's very simple, and I think it's easy for anyone to adopt. Um, and this has been in, this is inspired from uh, Orca's um, ethical matrix. Um, and really, what what you're doing here is just highlighting at the top. If you see on the first row, what are your model's weaknesses? So you will work with your stakeholder groups. You will learn over, and this happens over a period of time. This is not something necessarily that you can do at a project at project by project level, but over a period of time, you've built a few models. You've built a couple of experiences. You can look at like um, where are the weaknesses of the model? What is it doing today? Uh, how does it impact our users negatively? What are our stakeholder issues with this model? And you can really kind of like highlight what the model weaknesses you think are. Um, and then if you see on the column on the left over there, you can highlight which stakeholder groups it impacts the most. And if you see, and, and I've just given some examples of potential stakeholder groups in various companies, but the part that I would love to like highlight is the user group here. So I've broken, like I've just said user group one, two, three, but this is really for us to fill out in terms of like your user segments and which segments you think um, are critical for, you know, as users of that particular AI product and how it impacts them. Um, and the colors represent like whether it's a significant impact or it's not so significant. So in a snapshot, you can really see where your model is mostly weak and what part needs to be addressed immediately. Um, and then like you can work with uh, various stakeholder groups in coming up with solutions. So like some examples could be data science product. I, has, I haven't had a design here, but design research, like uh, any of your stakeholder groups that you want to work with to build solutions uh, and whatever that solution might be, you can rank that against like how significantly it will impact that particular problem space. Um, and if it's light green, it's just like, it may not directly impact it, but it indirectly impacts that problem space. So again, like in a snapshot, Snapshot, you can kind of prioritize like, you know, what is your weakest area of your model and how how could you begin to strategize and, and start addressing these concerns? And you need to kind of really keep a pulse check on this because um, models get stale really quickly and require a lot of monitoring. Um, and I won't go into this in too much detail, but really have working with your legal teams to have a regulatory and compliance document put together uh, is also like super like critical when it comes to building models that especially impact like millions of users. Um, yeah, and I'll end with a key final like takeaways, which is, um, it's very critical. Your deliverables create a lot of clarity and they drive alignment across many different teams. Um, consistent documentation definitely drives quality, accountability, and improvements. And finally, <clears throat> having an error recovery strategy is key depending on whether your use case has the appetite for some risk. Um, and the compliance and building ethical um, models is, is, will highly drive like trustworthy uh, model building. Uh, and that's it. Uh, that's all that I have today. Uh, thank you so much. And I'm happy to like answer any questions if there are any. Fantastic. Thank you so much. So feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question, or you could type it in the comments below if you want. All questions are welcome. Hey, Gayatri. Uh, should I go first? Sure. Yes, please do. Okay. Thank you for the talk. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I think a lot of things you've talked about, you've really demystified uh, several steps 
for me. So thanks a lot. This was very informative. Uh, I have one question around feature engineering. So as a PM, how much of the uh, effort do you spend in doing feature engineering and how do you discover? Do you, do you depend a lot more on the data scientists? Uh, especially, I think, when you're doing for a zero to one model. Uh, so can you talk a little bit more your journey for feature engineering in zero to one versus when you're improving a model? Yeah. yeah, no, I, in either case, I think that uh, hasn't changed because we've built a lot of zero to one as well as improved versions of models. So um, I think it's very critical. I don't think feature engineering should be done in a silo. Um, another thing that I forgot to mention there was uh, once the once the data scientist and I collaborate on feature engineering, we also take this to our stakeholder groups. So that's why we are building that document or deliverable over there so that we can share it with different stakeholders. So you must share it with, let's say, if you have trust and safety partners or, you know, um, internal like uh, content or editorial teams, uh, you have to share this with them because you uh, you shouldn't be building the model from one person's perspective or one function's perspective. So if that process is not collaborative, it will not be inclusive and it will lead to when you like if you map out your ethical matrix, then you will see that the model will have a lot of weaknesses in terms of specific types of bias. So highly recommend not doing feature engineering in isolation and not having that done just by the data science group, group um, but really working together with the, the PM should be definitely involved, uh, no question about that, but going beyond just the PM, but also like taking feedback from your stakeholder groups to understand understand like you know what features they think are important and then making a call based on uh like the correlation analysis would be uh would be critical so yeah uh, and 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 you don't always do feature engineering so if you're if you're using um like an off-the-shelf model sometimes you're, you're not really that deeply involved so there's that's again like comes back to like the decision of like which model you want to use and how interpretable you want that model to be. So if you're working on a use case that is like really critical and um, is making a key decision, uh, there are instances where like they are using models to decide whether teachers get fired or not. Like, so when it's like something that critical, the features have to be completely transparent, visible, and has to be inclusive. And for that, you need different perspectives in the room. Thank you. Uh, hi, Gayatri. Uh, thanks for the talk. So. Uh, so my question is, you you had talked about the personalized ranker and the cross encoder ways of, uh, you know, the models, right? Um, so my question is, given today's situation, right? I mean, I understand a lot of models were actually boost in the past, but now some of the LLM-based models are getting a lot of uh, improvements, even with inference. I think GPT, uh, yeah. ChatGPT, they just released five times of inference. So I'm, my, my question is, like, where would you start off, right? Would you now hypothetically start off with uh, more of an LLM-based model considering that it's going to keep improving over time? Plus there's, like you also mentioned the reusability aspects and things like that, right? So wondering like what your take is on that. Yeah, I think like uh, this is a great question and it's something that we are tackling uh, right at this moment. And that example, I'll say, was a made up example. And again, for confidentiality reasons, I can't provide the exact thing that we are using. Um, but like that was just uh, exaggerated to make a point of like how you choose uh, something. But to answer your question, yes. Um, I think the key thing here is to understand like, so, so search is a bit of a uh, challenging domain because uh, usually you would look at like, what are the user's job to be done? But in search, the job to be done is to find a document, to retrieve a document, to find the product, right? So it's inherently a more speculative kind of like uh, feel. Uh, and so what uh, what some of the things that have worked for us is like really trying to understand how your users are searching and what are the queries that are driving maximum kind of whatever is your objective. So if you're an e-commerce platform, what queries are driving maximum revenue? How are users searching for that? What is that percentage of users and the percentage of the queries that are uh, aligned with that? And then making a call on like whether that particular type of search that the user is making requires a large language model that drives, uh, that is using like uh, vectors and relevancy as like the key goal or is there something like that you can rely more on elastic search to do that so i think it comes down to like now within the various user segments how are your users searching on the platform um so an example at what part could be that like a, like a huge group of our uh, users come to the platform looking for one story or one uh, author and then that's because of the word of mouth marketing and what's happening on book talk and things like that so um uh, next step would be to see like okay 
like for these users who do come there, what is their success rate? What is the recall rate? Or how much revenue are those users driving? And if we prioritize that, and that would be more of a navigational query, maybe we wouldn't necessarily want to use large language models to address that problem. So I think it's a bit of like a trial and error and a lot of experimentation, but we definitely want, if it's more exploratory, you definitely want to move towards vector search. And that does impact like visibility and transparency a little bit. And I think like there must be different types of risk mitigation strategies, maybe design focused risk mitigation strategies that you have to adopt to address the whole product experience there. I don't know, does that answer your question? Yeah, I mean, I, I get what you're saying, right? But I guess the one thing that I'm wondering is like, you know, there are situations where you don't know if, you know, um, just by approaching it from the LLM based perspective, right? Is it going to be more, um, it's going to yield more in long term, right? Just because there's just other things that are going to, you know, be helpful for searching, like, you know, some of the navigational search can also eventually, you know, you might benefit from being more explored exploratory right um so um so yeah that's what i was thinking but, but i get what you're saying right yeah thanks yeah yeah and in that case maybe we would focus on like low risk areas to use those um and you know not drive like something as big as a search experience to kind of get comfortable with that and and see um because i think you're right like we, we have to even though it might not necessarily be how your current users are using it mm -hmm. it might add like a, a product differentiation and competitive advantage so you might have to start investing in, in it in some form or the other so maybe having like multimodal search would be a, a, like a way to like test that out. Yeah. Got it. Thank you so much. Ashley, my follow-up question was around that, uh, Gayatri, that uh, can you talk a little bit more about the multi multimodal? Because essentially what you've said is that you have uh, certain users who are looking for something very specific and you want to have very high precision, but then there are people who are doing free flowing searches, right? Uh, randomly looking. So how do you balance that in your solutioning? And, and yeah, can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, no, this is a good question. It's a really hard question because we haven't really successfully figured this out. So we are still in the experimentation phase and we're trying different things out. Um, and like one of the things that are commonly like, at least in, like I'm following a lot of like other leaders who have done things like this already. So I'm not definitely an expert here is to use different types of formats and like really understand the content in a lot of depth and use that to rank. But I, I I don't actually know um, how you would do that. And I think leveraging different formats would be really critical. Maybe having more of a conversational search, like these are smaller POCs that I think you can test out, but personally I haven't really done anything. So I don't want to uh, like, you know, give an incorrect way, but I do think that the field is like really, uh, there's a lot of eyeballs and a lot of like research being done here. So I think we need to keep a close pulse on it and be ready to kind of jump in and try different things. Yeah. Thank you. Amazing. We have time for one more question before we wrap up. Am I next? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for all the presentation. Uh, quite impressive to feed everything at such a time. Um, you mentioned a case where you said you changed the pipelines that lifted the accuracy a lot. So maybe it would be possible to share some details there. What happened? What was the problem behind that? The pipeline change caused that increase in the accuracy. Yeah. So uh, like, uh, just uh, note that those numbers were not accurate, like exactly what we noticed. Again, for privacy reasons, I couldn't share that. But uh, the problem that we did face was uh, like a broken pipeline issue, and the fact that we weren't using. Uh, we we weren't using updated data, so I think like the uh, we had to fix the inference part of the pipeline because I think the data was outdated and we weren't training the model on new data uh, since like 2019. It was a big uh, issue that we that went unnoticed under the radar. So because it was such a big issue of like not having retrained the model ever since its first launch, um, and we had to like because we were not re uh, training that model on new data in in live production. So we had to build the pipeline to be able to do that and then have like some sort of batch job in place so that new data is fed to that model every day. So I think these are just like maintenance work uh, that we should be keeping an eye on in terms of how our models are um, not getting stale. Um, and this was just one of the uh, like issues that we uncovered. Gotcha, thanks. But I think your key partner here would be. Yeah, thank, thank you so much.
you did such a great job presenting and I definitely learned a lot and I feel like everyone else did as well. Thank you so much. Of course. So for everyone watching, I am putting a link to our upcoming cohort in the chat. If you want to check that out, you can view it right here. Just putting this in. Okay, so you should all see this right now. And if you have any questions, comments, ideas, don't be shy to reach out and we are here to support you. Sorry, the link didn't go in. Let's try this again. There we go. Yeah, so that has all the information you need to scroll through everything. Um, there are exercises, there's workshops, there's lots of good stuff. And thank you again for taking the time. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you all in the next one.